Uh, I saw Adam speak in Philadelphia about five or so months ago, and I did not want to be as captivated and moved by his talk as I was because everybody loves to hate this guy, and, you know, it's just, it's just easy to fall on the bandwagon, right? But, of course, I don't fall on the bandwagon. I keep an open mind, and I don't shoot messengers, and I listen to the, what they have to say and the message, and the message is articulated and as coherent and as to the heart of the matter out of this man's mouth than I have heard from just about anyone as of right now. I am genuinely impressed and intrigued by his evolution to where he is now, and I am so glad to include him. Although it might not be intuitive for Adam Kokesh to be at the Free Your Mind conference, when you hear what he has to say and you see the big picture and Adam's thoughts, uh, you will see how coherent and how intuitive of a fit it is. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Kokesh. Love you too, brother. All right, just to get everybody focused in here, I, I really was inspired by Derek getting everybody to howl yesterday. So I made it easy. I've got a visual aid for you for this exercise. It's really easy. Can everybody give me like a Braveheart style freedom on three? Ready? One, two, three. Freedom! Awesome. All right, now if we can do that, we can do the wave, right? One, you guys, is everybody ready for this? I'm going to get the t-shirt cannon X, I swear. All right, one, two, three. We got to stand up. Everybody, come on, get on your feet. All right, thank you. All right, now everybody's fresh and focused, and I got everybody's attention. I'm so grateful to be here. This is my first time at a Free Your Mind conference, and I have to say, is this not the most beautiful crowd of conference attendees you've ever had the pleasure of being a part of? I mean, I, I, one of the ways that, that, that Bob would say it's not intuitive for me to be here is I'm a little more like, you know, rational and hard-headed, and yet I, the energy here, you'll hear me say, like, yeah, you can feel it, and it's, it's really actually, some of the sensibility here that's really new to me, that's a part of my evolution, is, is really starting to rub off on me, and I've gained a lot from being here. It's, it's been such a pleasure. Um, I suppose one of the, the things Bob mentioned that's become a hallmark of my activism kind of accidentally is how I've gone through uh, a major personal shift in my own life, going from a uh, Marine Corps, uh, civil affairs, non-commissioned officer, going to Iraq, volunteering, to getting in trouble with the Marine Corps, to coming out being an anti-war activist and going through, uh, dealing with PTSD very publicly, uh, going through a philosophical evolution, a personal evolution, and to uh, a point today where I'm realizing, you know, what it really is as a spiritual evolution, as this human process of development and moving forward. And it is not my typical audience that we have here at the Free Your Mind conference, but it's Something that, that really unites all of us as activists that's especially strong here. You know, I speak to a lot of groups of people where they're like, yeah, we like to show up and feel right about everything. <laughs> Thanks, Adam, for giving us that, you know, bolstering of our worldview. You really helped me, you know, feel good about myself. But here, there's a, there's a greater level of engagement. And it really is an honor to speak at this event. I hope I get to come back in the future. So... What I want to talk about today is pooping everywhere. No, okay, wait. I'm not supposed to just read the slides. This presentation is going to work that way. Uh, what, I, what I want to talk about today is uh, government subversion of the activist community in general. So I got to start with a little housekeeping. If you are an undercover government agent, would you please raise your hand? Okay, good, we're among friends here, just checking. So, 
there were so many people putting up cool graphics for their presentations. I was like, I gotta find some Alex Gray painting and this is what came up. So this is really <laughs> an appropriate way for me to, to segue into talking about subversion of the activist community. And um, I, I, before I get into this too much, I, I wanna reiterate something that came up on the panel talk last night that was so important to me that I think is really the most important thing that, that I would wanna convey to this group in particular in all of the varied interests that are represented here and all the different things you've heard talked about this weekend. There's a lot of stuff that dehumanizes the enemy. And this is something I, I, I for those of you who were here last night, I, I'm sorry to repeat myself, but this is, this is so important to me. And I really wanna make sure that everybody understands this and, and how it was essential to my process of growth and development as an individual, as an activist. And I didn't really realize the full implications of this when I first heard about this idea, dehumanization of the enemy. We talked about this a lot in Iraq, Veterans Against the War. And this is something that has been a course of uh, human conflict, or part of the, the, the historical course of human conflict. It's been essential you know, to get people to dehumanize the enemy. If you, because it, 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 it is our nature as lovers in that highest form of humanity, right? To not kill each other. It's really unnatural. Like we are, we are, as lovers, as human beings, we are built to be cooperative, not to live in conflict with each other. And so in order to convince people in the military to kill someone, you have to put them through this severe conditioning. And you have to use propaganda. And this is, we see this in you know, the 20th century history of, of uh, American warfare with uh, you know, World War II, Krauts, Nips, right? They're not really humans. We can use these racially derogatory terms against them and it makes it easier to kill them. You know, Vietnam, it was gooks and zipper heads and all the, you know, I mean, I could keep going. It just, it's on and on. And in Iraq, you know, Hajis, Dune Coons, you know, it's just, it's insane that, that we allow this to happen to ourselves, that we haven't as a species, just in this basic way, eliminated that kind of racist thinking that makes war possible in the first place, that we still let humans talk to each other that way. But what I realized is that we do this too as activists, as change agents. And I think that's what, that's what I really want to speak to tonight, not just the beautiful people here at the Free Your Mind Conference, but you know, the global community of activists, the people who want to change the world to make it a better place, who are willing to invest. It's not a sacrifice. If you think of it as a sacrifice, you're doing it wrong. If you're not having, it fun, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong but it's an investment, it's something that we care about because we see the greater value in working for the future world that humanity is capable of. And I started off in my activism with a lot of anti-cop stuff. You know, I was with Iraq Veterans Against the War, we were doing not really full-on civil disobedience where you're challenging a specific law, but civil disobedience, protest, where you know, it's protesting without a permit, that kind of thing. So you know, I've been arrested over three dozen times. I've done a you know, total of about somewhere, if you add it all up, maybe six, eight months in jail. And with the cops, it's really easy. I mean, how many of you have had a bad experience in your life at one point or another with law enforcement? Hey, how about that? <laughs> Makes it really easy to demonize the enemy but then we play into exactly the kind of divisionary mindset that they require to keep us oppressed. And so here, I hear a lot of talk about, oh, it's the aliens, or it's you know, this, this mythological group, or that mythological group, and I get the metaphors, I get the analogies, that's all great, but when we're talking about human beings, I don't care if it's Hillary Clinton, or George Soros, or you know, the Koch brothers, or the Rockefellers, or whoever it is, these are humans too. We all have the same fundamental needs. We all have the same fundamental desires and we are all affected by the trauma that we subject each other to here. And we perpetuate that when we demonize the enemy instead of being able to see our common humanity. And that is so essential if we wanna really move humanity forward 
that we don't push people away because they don't conform to what we call awake or our sense of awareness, right? Because we use this term awake, you know, are you awake? And it's a really unnecessary term because it, uh, or a bad analogy, very limiting, because it implies that anybody who doesn't have our particular awareness is asleep. And we talk a lot about the love behind what we're doing, but as soon as we create an other within the human family, we are failing in that potential of love. And so I just, I just, I, I, that's why I love this picture. So to see, you know, someone meditating, getting gassed, getting sprayed with uh, pepper spray is, um, I, I think, beautifully emblematic of what I'm trying to portray here is that that person can maintain their zen in their center despite being, being pepper sprayed. By the way, how many of you have, uh, I guess it's always, it's always fun to ask my audiences, how many of you have been arrested before? All right. Oh, wow. All right. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> how many of you have been pepper sprayed in the face before? Uh, not so many hands that time. All right. So what motivates us? Have you ever been so angry that you tackled a horse? <laughs> It was a major part of my evolution to get away from the anger. You know, I came back from Iraq and it was like, holy crap, my buddies died for lies? Are you kidding me? I risked my life so Halliburton could get rich? Are you kidding me? Now, when, in, in this process of waking up, if you'll accept that imprecise term, we all go through a reactionary phase, right? How many of you have ever, and, and, and for me, I, I make the focus of, of my activism government, but how many of you in the, in the course of, of waking up at some point have looked at government and been angry? Oh, dang. What an emotional group. When, when I talk to political people, they're like, well, I don't know if I'm so in touch with my feelings as to be able to raise my hand for that question, but yeah, I'm pretty pissed off. Okay, how many in the course of your activism have felt afraid of government. Okay, good. At least you can be honest about that, right? How many of you, in looking at the state of the world and seeing the pain that's caused by the people who use government to control and exploit and create violence, how many of you have felt, maybe, maybe when looking at the victims of war, how many of you have felt sad or depressed at some point in the course of waking up? Wow. So what do we do with this, this negativity? We go out and tackle horses, right? No. Okay. We go out on the street corner with our signs and our bullhorns and say things like, now join me in my fear and my pain and my anger and my depression. I know some of you as activists are laughing because you've been that guy before, right? You've had, that, you've had that experience. And what's the response that you get? It's not very good, is it? <laughs> Screw you. I'm going back to watching Dancing with the Stars. Why would I want your truth if it doesn't make your life better? That's bullshit. You're doing it wrong. If your truth doesn't enlighten you, as in bring light and joy into your life, that's not enlightenment. Being aware of pain and anger is not wisdom. Indulging and in, in, in giving attention to suffering is not how we move forward from this paradigm of violence. So for myself, this is the commercial break part of the presentation. <laughs> In high school, I was voted least likely to ever finish reading a book. <laughs> and then I wrote one. <laughs> I had to go to jail. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm an author. Not, not all of us Marines are as dumb as we look, I swear. But I went to jail for four months for civil disobedience for loading a shotgun in the ironically named Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and while I was there, people sent me all the greatest manifestos, the greatest books that, that had contributed to my worldview. I got a lot of books that I'd read already. Uh, I got a lot that I got to share with other inmates. But I realized that there was a market demand for, for this book. And 
I describe this as the ultimate red pill, the quickest way to take someone from zero to I get it, at least in terms of statism, of government, of moving humanity towards a world of harmony. And I want to just be clear about something, because sometimes we, we have a lot of silly disagreements where we define words differently. And this is a very intellectual community, obviously, very passionate community, and we often find ourselves talking past each other. So I just want to challenge people to consider what is government, because when we define this, we realize that it is an unethical institution that is holding back humanity, right? Should I just ask for a boo for government? <laughs> all right, cool, we're all on the same page, yeah. No, but to govern, you know, and by the way, these, these funny memes that say government, govern to control, mind, oh, it's mind control. No, that's a suffix, get over yourself. You don't have to be clever to point out that government is an unethical institution. Government is a territorial monopoly on the initiation of violence. It is by definition violent and coercive. To govern is to control. When we talk about the institutions of government, we are talking about institutions that depend on violence and coercion to maintain their power. So when I talk about a stateless society or a world without government, what I'm really talking about is a world without institutional violence, not a world without social organization, not a rule, and we say the term anarchy to define it properly, it's not a world without rules, it's a world without rulers. It's a world where self-governance is respected, self-ownership is respected. You can describe this philosophy in, in two different ways. You know, a lot of libertarians like to come at this from the perspective of individuality or individualism or selfishness and say, no, it's I own myself, I own my stuff, therefore the non-aggression principle, you're not allowed to hurt me, this is the foundation of ethics. And that's all true and good. We can just as well define this in terms of relationships. When you have a society where all human relationships are free of violence, free of coercion, you don't have government anymore. It just doesn't exist. So you can redefine this word, but this is what we're talking about. And so I took all of these great books and I decided to boil them down into one book that was uh, short enough even a Marine could read it. It's 100 pages. It's free in every digital format possible. We've had over 2 million downloads. We've had over 50,000 copies in print now. This is the fourth printing. I'm really excited about being right about what kind of market there is for this and the kind of collaborative effort that this book represents. Because I started writing it when I was in jail and I had a vision for it, but I needed a lot of help to make it everything that it could be with uh, in line with the principles of nonviolent communication, no opinion, conjecture, wish wishful thinking or exaggeration, anything like that that anybody could object to. So it's something that you can share and stand behind. I invited about 300 people to help edit it, and they did such an amazing job helping me polish this down draft after draft to get it to be exactly what it needs to be. And I'm just so honored that there are so many people who have taken this and made it an essential part of their activism. And one of the reasons this is so important is because we often get distracted by the minutia. And again, in the uh, panel last night, I said, you know, if you're getting stabbed in the back, what's more important? Studying the knife or getting it out? And I think there are a lot of powers that be, to use an inclusive term, who are more than happy to see you distracted by symbolism and history and minutia and things that take us away from this as activists, or even individual cases of corruption. You know, I like to think that there are really only three legitimate metrics of, of freedom activism, or activism in general. And, and one is, how many people are you waking up? How many converts are you winning? When I say converts, I don't mean to a specific ideology. I hope you can appreciate this distinction. When I say converts, you should know what I mean. Because what you're converting people to is not a dogma, but to the anti-dogma. You're converting people to thinking for themselves. You're giving them a gift. That is the power that we have as activists. And I think that's the most important metric. How many people are you bringing into this community of activists, right? The second one is, how much are you reducing the actual violence and coercion in society? You know, if you get a bad cop off the force, you know, that's a great thing. If you get someone off from an individual case, you get an innocent person out of jail, you stop a war, you minimize... Uh, you know, the destructive policies of government one way or another, that's awesome. And then the third one is, are, are you having fun? Are you enjoying it? Is this something that is, that is enlightening and sustaining for yourself? And that's, that's so important is, you know, things that I've 
embraced for myself. And I would just challenge you to come up with, maybe, maybe you like my principles, maybe you would word it in different ways or my objectives in that sense. But just to give yourself a sense of why are you an activist? Why are you here? Why are you doing this? Have, have a sense of that core motivation. And because I, I'm talking tonight about inoculating us as an activism community against government subversion, it's one of the things I want to point out that the people they come after are often not people like me, but more people like Michael Hastings. Does everybody know the, the story of Michael Hastings? He was, a, he was a reporter who was working on a story that was going to expose some corruption within the Defense Department, and he you know, had a very, very mysterious car crash that killed him, right? And it's funny because this came out recently with the, uh, the CIA data dump that, oh, hey, they were developing the technology to do exactly that. How about that? But we don't need to do that. You know, we don't need to play whack-a-mole. If you really want to make a better world, fighting this law and that law and, and petitioning and, and, you know, all the little things that, that the government wants you to do, like, oh, yeah, call your congressman. Change the world. Uh-huh, sure. You fight inch by inch, and they take a mile behind your back and laugh at you while they're doing it. And they pat you on the head and say, good little citizen. So I hope you can keep that in mind in terms of staying in tune for the bigger picture. And so for me, a part of this, and by the way, this is a picture at my place in Arizona. I recently bought 10 acres where I'm homesteading, started from scratch. This is uh, my good friend Kenny, the anarchist chef, Pellerantano, who's in the room wearing a freedom shirt somewhere. Kenny, are you here? Hey, there he is. Give him a round of applause. His cooking is also a big part of the reason I went vegan. This is the best strategy for converting people to veganism. Just give them awesome vegan food all the time. That's what Kenny does. He's just, he just likes to cook for people. So this is us building a geodesic dome, a little experimental architecture. I have my own voting booth. <laughs> if you want to change the world, vote early, vote often. I do it every morning. But this is what makes the lifestyle that I've embraced really meaningful and valuable. We have a campfire almost every night at my place, and it's the uh, Freedom Farm Campfire family get together almost every night there, and it's just a really beautiful way of bringing people together. And I want to point out, in terms of activism, you know, we're often led to think it has to be about confrontation, it has to be about conflict, but sometimes it's just you know, political judo. Hey, I'm just going to step back. I'm just going to step away from the guns. I'm just going to avoid this. I'm just going to be over here. I'm going to go galt. I'm going to not contribute to the system. I'm going to stop paying taxes. I can't even remember when it was for me. I think the last time I paid taxes was... <laughs> I was running for Congress as a Republican. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm better now. <laughs> yeah, I used to be a Republican. I'm better now, thank you. But uh, yeah, I haven't filed income taxes. Uh, you know, and and I, I, this is just something for everybody to consider. How, how in line with your values is your lifestyle? Can you encourage other people to live more in line with, their, with your values or with their values to withdraw that material support from government, to be self-reliant, to build stronger communities, to increase... Uh, power locally when so much of it has been taken away by central authority. So one of the things I want to talk about, I guess, well, I should go back here um, before I get into that next slide. My start in full-time activism was Iraq Veterans Against the War. I got out of the Marine Corps November 30, 2006, one of those dates you never forget. And I was just disgruntled enough to really start questioning things. I was really pissed off about having gotten in trouble for, broading, for bringing a pistol back, the uh, broading. That's a great, bringing a pistol back from Iraq the first time I went, and I volunteered to go back because I didn't get a Purple Heart the first time. Yeah, that's, whoo, <laughs> yeah. Don't give me a rifle, give me a straight jacket, holy crap. But I, I didn't get a Purple Heart the first time I went to Iraq, so I wanted to go back, and I got in trouble for bringing a pistol back, and I was a sergeant who spoke Arabic, with civil affairs combat experience, now managing a barracks at Camp Pendleton, mowing lawns. 
And that led me to be just pissed off to really start questioning things. So when I got out of the Marine Corps, I moved to Washington, D.C. to get a master's in political management at George Washington University and dropped out to become a full-time activist with Iraq Veterans Against the War. Don't let your schooling get in the way of your education. It's never too late to drop out. So in Iraq Veterans Against the War, um, we studied Vietnam Veterans Against the War a lot. We studied our, our predecessors as activists and in all the ways that the Iraq War was an echo of the Vietnam War, so was the activist movement. And, and I was really sad to find out that, you know, I, as someone who was deeply principled about all this, that the majority of the anti-war movement who was backing us up as Iraq veterans against the war were really much more ideologically motivated liberals. It was an anti-Bush movement more than an anti-war movement. And it was really sad to see that once Obama won the primaries, basically disappeared and then, you know, Obama now has killed more children with drone strikes than all other Nobel Peace Prize winners put together. Quite an accomplishment. Yeah. Is that too soon? Okay. How many veterans does it take to screw in a light bulb? You wouldn't know you weren't there, man. <laughs> Best thing about being a veteran is being able to tell stupid jokes. Oh, and discounts. <laughs> I always forget to ask for my veterans discount. If you want if you want to uh, you know, blow smoke up a vet's butt, I'll take that. Thank you. Thank you for your service of uh, banksters, politicians and war profiteers, right? But Looking back, I studied COINTELPRO and the subversion of these movements in the 60s. So for those of you that don't know, and the reason I'm using Wikipedia is not because I'm lazy. Because it is shit. It's because what I want to show is how obvious this is. Now, this, is, this is the generally accepted public record. This is understood as what COINTELPRO is. So COINTELPRO, a portmanteau derived from counterintelligence program, was a series of covert and often illegal projects conducted by the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation aimed at surveilling, infiltrating, discrediting, and disrupting American political organizations. Wait a second. You mean the government does stuff that's illegal? I thought, well, if the president doesn't, that means it's not illegal. Was that a good enough Nixon impersonation? Did you get, okay. It just wasn't that funny. FBI records show that COINTELPRO resources targeted groups and individuals that the FBI deemed subversive, including the anti-Vietnam War organizers, activists of the Civil Rights Movement or the Black Power Movement, for example, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Black Panther Party, feminist organizations, anti-colonial movements such as Puerto Rican independence groups like the Young Lords, and a variety of organizations that were part of the broader New Left. White supremacists such as the Ku Klux Klan were also targeted. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover issued directives governing COINTELPRO, ordering FBI agents to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, neutralize, or otherwise eliminate the activities of these movements and especially their leaders. Under Hoover, the agent in charge of COINTELPRO was William C. Sullivan. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy personally authorized some of the programs, although Kennedy only gave written approval for limited wiretapping of MLK's phones on a trial basis for a month or so, right? This is the give him an inch part. Hoover extended the clearance so his men were unshackled, you know, like by ethics, law, or morality, to look for evidence in any areas of King's life they deemed worthy. So if you didn't know about this, now you know. Very important part of American history. How was the program exposed? The program was successfully kept secret until 1971 when the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI burgled an FBI field office in Media, Pennsylvania, took several dossiers and exposed the program by passing this material to news agencies. Many news organizations initially refused to publish the information. Within the year, Director J. Edgar Hoover declared that the centralized COINTELPRO was over and that all future counterintelligence operations would be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. And from then on, the government did nothing wrong or unethical ever again. Additional documents were revealed in the course of separate lawsuits filed against the FBI by NBC correspondent Carl Stern, the Socialist Workers' Party, and a number of other groups. In 1976, the Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities in the United States Senate, of the United States Senate, commonly referred to as the Church Committee for its chairman, Senator Frank Church of Idaho, launched a major investigation of the FBI and COINTELPRO. And the 
members of Congress behind that promise that they would never do anything bad ever again. Journalists and historians speculate that the government has not released many dossiers and documents related to the program. Many released documents have been partly or entirely redacted. Right. Okay, now here's where it gets really interesting. Now, before I don't want to distract you with stuff I haven't read yet. Excuse me. So the point of all of this and looking back at this history is to be able to extrapolate what we're experiencing now in terms of subversion of the if you will, global activist community. I like to think of it as the freedom movement. It's awesome to hear how much enthusiasm there is here for freedom, but there's a, a bigger community of activists who are challenging government authority. And that's, I think, what really unites us is people who are anti-authority change agents. So we've seen that, so here we go. These are the methods that they used back in the 60s. First, infiltration. This is why we had to do that housekeeping and make sure there, there were no infiltrators here. Agents and informers did not merely spy on political activists. Their main purpose was to discredit and disrupt. Their very presence served to undermine trust and scare off potential supporters. The FBI and police exploited this fear to smear genuine activists as agents. Now, we do have some evidence of this. We'll come back to that. Two, psychological warfare. And I suppose it's, it's one of the great things about coming to a, a conference such as this or a community like this, where people really are sensitive to a lot of the ways that government is capable of subverting us as individuals. And psychological warfare, you know, we talk about the bigger propaganda, we talk about the bigger conditioning, but here we're talking about really specific stuff. And it was great to hear in some of the talks yesterday about how there's even now, with high tech ways, they're able to manipulate people, trigger emotions, trigger thoughts, plant thoughts in people. And that's kind of what I want to get to, again, the point of this, but we'll come back to that. The FBI and police used myriad dirty tricks to undermine progressive movements. They planted, oh, by the way, here, progressive, little sidebar on the word progressive, if I may, meaning progress that's been co-opted to mean this big government status leftist, you know, confused with the Democratic Party thing, just to get that semantic thing out of the way. They planted false media stories and published bogus leaflets and other publications in the names of targeted groups. They forged correspondence, sent anonymous letters, and made anonymous telephone calls. And now they can read everything on your cell phone. How easy would it be? Can you imagine just, you know, if you were in like a romantic relationship with someone and every other text that you sent them was deleted? You think that would, you think that would cause any conflict or confusion perhaps? They spread misinformation about meetings and events, set up pseudo movement groups run by government agents and manipulators, strong armed parents, employers, landlords, school officials, and others to cause trouble for activists. They used bad jacketing to create suspicion about targeted activists, sometimes with legal consequences. So just to go to that page here, bad jacketing. The practice of creating suspicion. Now I want you to, before I read this, be ready to think if this applies to anyone you've ever heard of in the activist community here. The practice of creating suspicion through the spreading of rumors, manufacture of evidence that a bona fide organizational, that bona fide organizational members usually in key positions are FBI slash police informers. Guilty of such offenses as skimming organization funds. Scholar Mark Anthony Neal writes that the FBI under Hoover used the technique against Black Panther Party and other black power organizations as part of its COINTELPRO operations. Neal writes that this technique was effective in isolating key individuals, forcing them out of the organization, and that its effectiveness was enhanced by the tendency of black power activists to divide among rigid racial, ideological, and increasingly gender lines. So. Harassment via the legal system. Gee, is any, anybody experiencing any of that in here? Hey, how about that? Thank you, Adamo, co-founder of CopBlock. Honored to have you here today. Everybody familiar with CopBlock.org? <laughs> the FBI and police abuse the legal system to harass dissidents and make them appear to be criminals. Okay, I'm gonna skim through now. Illegal force. The FBI conspired with local police departments to threaten dissidents, con conduct illegal break-ins in order to search dissident homes and to commit vandalism, assaults, beatings, and assassinations. The object was to frighten or eliminate dissidents and disrupt their movements. Now, you see in the picture there the body of Fred Hampton, national spokesman for the Black Panther Party, murdered by members of the Chicago Police Department as part of a COINTELPRO operation. The FBI specifically developed tactics intended to heighten tension and hostility between various factions in the black militancy movement, for example, between the Black Panthers, et cetera, resulting in numerous deaths. So, this is Scott Camille. 
of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Scott Camille is a hero of mine. It was really cool to hear earlier that Bob and some other activists here are familiar with him from Gainesville, Florida. But it's almost like my anti-war veterans activism was an echo of his in the same way, again, that the you know, Iraq War was an echo of the Vietnam War. He did two tours. He was shot in Vietnam, um, came home, uh, was, was very pro-war when he got home. I mean, it's hard, right, to admit that you were wrong? And for me, starting in Iraq Veterans Against the War as the start of my activism was like, oh, hey, you know how we uh, invaded that country and killed and tortured all those people and blew all that shit up? That was a mistake. Yeah. Sorry about that. It's pretty easy to admit any fuck up after that, right? Scott Camille came home, though, because until you get to that point, you have a huge psychological investment in what you've done and what you've been a part of. And this is a really important thing, too, for being forgiving and understanding and welcoming of people into the activist community. Because we live in such a culture of guilt and shame and punishment and judgment that we make it harder for people to admit that they were wrong. We don't even realize how that directly creates a barrier to us winning converts. But for a veteran to come home and say, yeah, I killed those people, and that was wrong, makes it really easy. So this is a picture of Scott Camille at Winter Soldier. He went to uh, a meeting with Jane Fonda and a bunch of other VVAW activists because he wanted to tell them how wrong they were. He wanted to be like, yeah, the war's so good. And he went there and was like, oh, crap, I really can't argue with anything they're saying. And next thing you know, he's an anti-war activist. Next thing you know, he's one of the most prominent members of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And I had the honor of meeting him uh, a few years ago in Washington, D.C. And this is the point where I'm going to switch to a video. about. <laughs> Neil was uh, advised that he was under arrest or something to that effect. Uh, a school ensued. He was shot one time. I understand the shot was in the back. The shot was fired by federal officers. Uh, Mr. Camille was taken to the hospital where he is in uh, fairly good condition in the intensive care unit. And the Drug Enforcement Administration, especially back then, and, and I don't know about now particularly because I don't have much interaction with them, but back then, was a group of cowboys. They sent in a woman, an attractive woman. She comes in as a, as a plan and she seduces Scott, which is easy to do. I, I mean, that didn't take any work. And, and um, uh, they start fooling around sexually and they start fooling around with drugs. She was my girlfriend and we were having fun. And she introduced me to two of her friends. And those were the two people um, that ended up shooting me. I was charged with um, Possession and delivery of marijuana, possession and delivery of cocaine, um, assaulting federal agents, and resisting arrest with violence. DEA uh, targets Scott. Um, their claim is they were looking for drugs. Um, they sure took a lot of stuff that didn't have a damn thing to do with drugs, uh, including all of his private papers. A federal jury came back, found me not guilty, and recommended that the agents be indicted for attempted murder. The agents didn't get in any trouble. In fact, all of the people involved moved up in rank. Getting shot um, by the agents and the way that they did that, um, it made me really bitter. Like, I, I just think that uh, there has to be a line somewhere and that what they did crossed over the line. For 10 years after that, I didn't do politics. I was so bitter. Why should I put my life at risk trying to educate people in the community when they don't stand behind me when the police come after me and try to kill me? If you haven't seen it, this is from an amazing documentary called uh, Scott Camille, Seasoned Veteran, uh, The Story of a Winter Soldier. And uh, it's about 40 minutes long. I, I very highly recommend that uh, everybody check that out when they get a chance. Excuse me, just a second. So this is mm -mm -mm. slideshow. All right, back to the slides. 
So this is the board of directors that I was on with uh, Iraq Veterans Against the War. Can you see the plant? Yeah, me neither. These are all beautiful, wonderful people who I worked with. This was an amazing organization of people who really cared about veterans coming home. And there was no overt subversion that we could prove or saw or knew of in the entire course of uh, the time that I was actively involved with Iraq Veterans Against the War anyway. But I have to ask, what do you think is more likely? That government got all nice and friendly and suddenly decided, oh yeah, we're just going to let activist groups do their thing from now on. Or they figured out more subtle ways of subverting the activist community. So when I think about the conflict that we experience with Iraq veterans against the war, they don't have to infiltrate anymore. By the way, one of the fun stories about VVAW was that there was a meeting they had in New Orleans in the uh, early 70s when the organization was on its decline that had six members show up. Two of them were CIA agents. Two of them were FBI agents. <laughs> and the other two were local cops. So <laughs> we welcome that kind of infiltration if it makes, it look, it makes us look that much bigger. But no, there's, it, you look at the history of COINTELPRO, what were they trying to do? They, it wasn't a program to shoot activists. That was a consequence that they were comfortable getting away with back then when we didn't have the access to information that we have now. But what they were trying to do was cause division, create artificial conflict, smear people, that's all it takes. Which means that when we today give into that, if it's genuine and organic, we're just doing their work for them. So if you wanted to take an organization like Iraq Veterans Against the War down, hey, you've got a lot of, uh, you got a lot of pissed off veterans, you got a lot of dudes with PTSD, you got a lot of high emotions, you've got a lot of high expectations, you don't have to infiltrate directly, although it would have been very easy and you, you might never know. And you know, I, I like to say that for myself, my resume as an activist is like my ultimate calling card of credibility, you know. I wrote the book on freedom after all. No, but I, you know, I've, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've seen a lot of conflict. I've seen a lot of things. I've been to jail, you know, I've been arrested, like I said, over three dozen times. But um, it could be anybody. And, and I don't mean this to be paranoid. I hope I don't make you paranoid because, you know, I could be wrong about all of this. My, my, you know, we know that government subverts activism groups even, you know, in the modern era. Occ Occupy Wall Street. We saw Occupy DC was infiltrated by uh, a member of the Metro Police Department, MPD. And she got caught because they recognized her from her Facebook profile photo. <laughs> I mean, this is what they're giving us to be like, yeah, it's happening, right? And then there's the case of Karen Sullivan, law enforcement officer who infiltrated the anti-war movement and international solidarity movements. There are other incidents even of local cops getting into this. And it's like... <laughs> what if it was me? You know, what if I was the plant? What if, what if I was the one for like all the great work that I'm doing publicly, you might never know, maybe behind the scenes I'm doing more to pull the movement down than, you know, and, and I think people who know me can like, can pr I, I'm comfortable talking about this because it's not true and there are enough people who could, who could prove this, but you could have someone who's, you know, publicly very, you know, positive and contributing and, and doing a lot of good work and, you know, they know that the kind of division they're causing, the rumors they're spreading, the credibility that they get from that allows them to do more damage than they would if they weren't. Right? So it's, it's one of those things, it's like an impossible enemy. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't punch it, you can't shoot it. Like, Marine don't know how to handle this situation. Wait a second. The one thing they didn't teach us in, uh, you know, this is, this is a, just a little comment about not being distracted. This is uh, attention deficit, hey look a squirrel. It's a new disorder just for activists. So part of this is about just say, you know, stay focused. Don't be distracted by that. Well, there's going to be division. There's going to be conflict. But if you're playing into that, like I said, you're doing the government's job for them. 
You know, so since I brought up this great focus clip art, I've got a great focus acronym here from some self-help thing I ripped off from the internet. Follow one course until successful. Well, you know, what is that course for us as activists? Slacktivism. It's, if you can't read, it says, so you're going to change the world with an online petition, a Facebook status update, and a couple of retweets. And the dude says, you're right. I should probably share a few more links. <laughs> I, think, I, I don't think I need to emphasize that point anymore. So what is it? Marine, Marine don't know how to handle this situation. Invisible enemy that you can't shoot, can't kill, can't see, can't smell. Well, the answer is the one thing they didn't teach us in boot camp, love. Although I know how to argue. I can argue like this. <laughs> These are the kind of arguments we should be having in the activist community, right? I love you more! This was just a fun clip art about cooperation I liked. It just, isn't that cool? All right, just threw that in there. So, if you're gonna read one book after mine, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, this is it. This is so huge. I'm so glad to see that this is, thank you that this is experience, we're seeing a resurgence of Marshall Rosenberg's work. And since I think it was Max Egan put it in his slideshow yesterday, the Marshall Rosenberg picture with the puppets I had to put it into. Um, Nonviolent communication, just to sum it up, for those of you who don't know, is a methodology of communication that gets us past all the kind of emotional manipulation and bullshit that prevents us from connecting at the heart and understanding each other's feelings and needs in a way to maximize the value of those communications and those relationships. So I think it's, it's, it's absolutely critical to this. But beyond that, as an activist, there are a few things that I've learned that I'd like to share. And I, I don't pretend that I have all the answers here. You know, I, I just... I've been around long enough, I got some, some things I want to point out and some uh, wisdom to share. And it just comes from this idea that it, we know that it's in the government's best interest, or it's in the nature of government, if you will, to subvert people who are working to change government, who are working to challenge authority, no kidding. And that we've, we can look at the history of this, we can look at the recent modern American history of subversion of activist groups, and we can extrapolate what's going on now from what was going on then. And I think if what they were trying to do then was create division between activists, and then we didn't find out you know, for decades after it was happening what exactly was happening, there's stuff going on now that we're not gonna find out about for a long time. But we can inoculate ourselves against it. We can prevent that from having an effect on us. And I think that if anything, I mean, government subversion techniques didn't get like worse over time. They got better over time. So now they can do this without detection. I think with a group like Iraq Veterans Against the War, you didn't have to infiltrate. You could just be the guy on the park bench for the one guy on the board of directors who's got really bad PTSD and be like, how come that other guy gets to give speeches all the time? You're the one who should be up on stage. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that guy's really bringing down the organization. You really need to point that out and bring that up at the next meeting. Yeah. It's subtle. They don't need to even be, even just that, even just that simple like, hey, we just hire people outside to screw with people that way. We can just create, you know, little conflicts like that. That I mean, all and all of a sudden, you know, you have a few incidents like that in a board meeting for an organization like this, and next thing you know, you're not getting anything done. That's all it takes. So for me, this is, this is you know, a little bit of the wisdom that, that I apply that I like to keep in mind. Know your goals. And like I said, for me, I think there are three legitimate activists or three legitimate metrics of freedom activism. Waking people up, minimizing violence, and having fun. Know your motivation. And... Um, does anybody know the answer to that question? What is your motivation? Thank you. Yes. There's an answer to this. It's love. Your motivation. It is your highest form as a human being to be a lover. That's your motivation. Never forget that. Know what satisfies you. And that's kind of about what in your activism is sustainable, making it sustainable. I've been doing this for 10 years, and I've seen a lot of people burn out. I've seen a lot of people come and go. 
I've seen a lot of people get overwhelmed. I've seen a lot of people like Scott Camille, right, get scared for one way or, you know, one thing or another. And it's usually not that. It's, you know, most people who burn out these days don't get shot in the back first. At least we've, we've come that far, right? How many of you, this is just kind of a fun question here, as activists have gone through a period when you've been really excited about something and really into something, and then after a while, you see that among the people involved in that activity or in that activism or organization, there's a lot of conflict or people you don't like, and you backed out and stepped away for a while. Yeah, look around the room for a second. How much time lost is that? How many less free minds is that? That hurts. That sucks. That really sucks to see that. I knew there were going to be, at least, I mean, I'm actually, I'm kind of honored that that many people raise their hands to that question. It's a lot of integrity. But it's also a sign that there are a lot of people here who are really activists in the way that I mean that. And it's, you know, it's so easy to burn out. It's so easy. And I, and I have to think that, you know, this is exactly what they want. They don't have to, you know, they, they don't have to have COINTELPRO. They can just have a little activist retirement program. We're just going to make it suck for you. We're going to take your YouTube revenue. We're going so, to censor you on social media. We're going to fuck with your email list. We're going to arrest you. We're going to threaten you with legal bullshit. We're going to embarrass you on the internet. And you're going to fucking retire. You're going to cry and you're going to give up. And I want, man, I wanted to, I've wanted to do that so many times. But what, the reason I don't stop, of all the things that scare me about this, you know, I've been, I've been pretty well trained to not be afraid of death. And that, you know, it doesn't really scare me to die in the course of doing what I'm doing. What scares me more than anything else is thinking that on my deathbed I might be if I'm lucky enough to be surrounded by children and grandchildren, to be able to, 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 to know, knowing what we all in this room know, what humanity is about to go through in an incredible leap forward that we are so fortunate right now to be living through. To be sitting on my deathbed saying, yeah, I watched that happen on television. Yeah, that was fun. That was cool to see. I was, I was there when that happened. as opposed to being able to say, when the time came and I had the opportunity to do something about it, I did absolutely everything I possibly could to make sure that you were born on the other side of statism, on the other side of a world of war and violence and central control by people who just want to exploit you. Yeah, we did that, we moved past that as humanity and I was a part of that. So surround yourself with positive people. And I'm, I'm honored to be joined by my friend Heather who suggested this for, for the PowerPoint today and for the, this presentation because you know, we are like here today surrounded by so many beautiful positive people and it is really awesome to be able to come together like this. And, and I hope that, um, should we do the, turn to the person on your left and shake their hand? Turn to the person on your right and shake their hand. All right, yeah, you've been doing that. You've been doing that. You've been taking advantage. You all, you're all already best friends at this point, right? Wow, that was so easy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Woo. All right, so I don't really have to say that here, but it's cool to have another little moment like that on Sunday night, right? Build each other up. Strengthen this community. Be loving and supportive and give people that encouragement, you know? People love that. You want to be lovable? Build other people up. It's really simple. Be the guy who laughs extra hard at other people's jokes and conversation. You know, be the guy always saying, yeah, right on. You know, be the person saying, I love what you're doing. You know, don't be, and if you know an activist, I'll tell you, you know, I love being recognized in public. Holy crap, that is so much fun. Be like, I've touched strangers' lives who are going to come up and be like, hey, Adam, thanks for that. You know what, don't be afraid to do that. If you see someone that you recognize through their work, or you just hear about it in conversation, whatever, go up to a stranger, hey man, I saw you on YouTube, I saw you on the news, I saw you in that video, that was awesome, thank you for doing what you do. So huge, you have no idea. Let's develop a culture of that kind of love and mutual support among activists. Can we do that? Yeah. So finally, ignore the haters. I know that's sort of like cliche, and I think it needs, 
to be expounded upon just a little bit because it's not as simple as that, you know? I mean, you can say ignore the trolls, right? People on the internet, commenters, <laughs> Defense Department sock puppet accounts. <laughs> But no, when, when I talk about ignore the haters, when I, when I think it means, you know, it, has, it has, a, has a much more important application than that because we're all haters sometimes, right? And in a way, part of this is that self-development. You have to ignore the hater inside yourself. <laughs> you know, you, you really have to address that and be the best activist you can be, bring the best self that you can to the world. And when you find other people engaged in hate in the movement, when you see other conflict, like even around this event, to touch on that little elephant in the room, do we really have to let ourselves be divided by stupid conflict like that when we have such a beautiful opportunity to come together as at a conference like this? I don't think so. We don't, life is too short. Fuck that. I don't have any haters, just people who haven't figured out how to love me yet. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, this meme that I did for myself sort of symbolizes a little bit of my internal struggle because, you know, I, I, I've been so conditioned to assume that other people aren't going to like me. You know, it's really hard to embrace this, this truth, this uh, reality that we live in a beautiful, nurturing world full of awesome, loving people. Like, you know, we're, we're, every little thing that conditions us to stay away from that holds us back from really being able to get up every day. And I, like, it's, like this, is, this is not something that, that I can say that I honestly live to the fullest extent, but, you know, I want to point this out because it's so important to bring in your best self to the world as an activist. So... <laughs> Of all the silly theories I've heard here, I have not heard a single person say, yeah, government is really good and necessary and essential to moving humanity forward. So I'm just, I want to say I'm, I'm honored by that. And I, I want to take, uh, let's see, how much time do I have left here? Okay, just a few minutes. I got to run through um, a bunch more stuff here. So I'll try to, try to make this quick. What, what's really important for me, what I see as the single most Significant thing that's, oh, whoops, I forgot to press, uh, press pause this time, excuse me. Is that we, well, first, you know, I pointed this out again in the, in the panel last night. This is so important, I can't say it enough. The work of Professor Steven Pinker at Harvard, pr at Harvard proves academically, statistically, that we are living in the most peaceful times in human history. When we talk about freedom, freedom is a world of non Violence. If there's violence in the world, someone's freedom is being violated. Hey, how about that, right? So when you realize that connection, that we are progressing, that this is the natural course of human evolution to get more cooperative over time, it gives you such confidence in, in, in the, the virtue of humanity. This is like my source of faith in humanity, that we are moving forward this way. What an incredible thing to celebrate. And it used to be, that, that violence came out of interpersonal conflict, intertribal conflict, so much more than today. Statistically, today, you are less likely to be subject to violence at the hands of another human being than ever before. And it's like we have raised our standard of ethics, you know, don't hit, don't steal, don't kill, to the point where it's like, well, unless you're government. Don't hit, don't kill, don't steal, unless you're a cop or an IRS agent or a soldier, right? Bullshit. But what we've done, what I see as this story of humanity's progress to become less violent over time is that we've taken all that violence and, and unethical behavior and we've, we've just relegated it to government. It's the only place we really allow it now. And the next step of human evolution is to eliminate government. And the way we do that is not by revolution, it's by evolution. And this is the most important thing in this entire book in terms of how we move forward is localization. We can take governments apart from the top down. We can restore power to local communities. We can eventually displace violent coercive systems with nonviolent cooperative systems. That's how we build the world that we want to see. So I think in this, there is a huge role for politics and consensus building. 
And so a project that I'm working on now that came out of, um, well, when I was a kid, I was always that jerk in the back of the classroom asking hard questions to the teacher that led them to be like, gee, you should be a lawyer someday. <laughs> Never, hey, let me answer your question. Just, you know, hey, you should be a lawyer someday. And so, you know, that led me into politics. And I got afraid of it for a while and jumped back into it, obviously. But um, people would ask me, like, well, hey, if you were president, what would you do, right? It's a pretty great thought exercise question. So what would I do if I was elected president? Well, quit and get a real job. Who should be president? Nobody. Human beings should be free. Hey, how about that, right? So this kind of developed over time to, well, hey, if I ran for president, I would abolish the entire federal government. You'd be a good start, right? And then I realized that that's, that's not really it either. It's about a, a peaceful, orderly disillusion. We want to make this a transition that doesn't pull the rug out from underneath anyone. If we're doing this because we care about people, the answer of, well, we're just going to let the dollar collapse and, you know, get my guns and my gold and my ammo and uh, hope that government spares me in its violent death throes as it desperately clings to power. And if you don't, hey, screw you. Good luck in, this, in the cities, you know. I'm sorry, but if you care about people, that's not an answer. And so we have to have a solution that's as big as the problem. So what I've come up with, well, I, was, I was originally uh, telling people that I was, I was running for president, and, and I was thinking, well, geez, what a terribly evil thing to say. <laughs> Hi, I'm running for president. I want to be in charge of you violently. So I'm running for not president. And what this is really about is what I'm calling now the American Referendum Project. Can we put to a vote, should America dissolve the United States federal government making the states the highest form of government in the land. Can we put this to a vote? How much freer, how much safer, how much more American would America be if we didn't have the American federal government? So this, was, uh, this is on my website now, kokishfornotpresident.com. You guys like my Superman picture? Because no one should be president, we are putting none of the above on the ballot in 2020 in the form of Adam Kokesh. The platform is simple. Declare the federal government of no authority, dissolve or privatize every agency, transitioning some functions to the states, liquidating all remaining assets to fund social programs as private charities, resign the presidency to become custodian of the federal government, and do it all with a single executive order on the very first day in office. But the, the reason we made it the American Referendum Project is to make it clear this isn't about me. This is a really nice way to not get shot by government as well, by the way. If I have a really good VP nominee, they shoot me, he just slides over or she, and then, hey, the whole thing continues. And that's why we're making this something that people can invest in where it's not about me. It's about this platform and, and this referendum and putting the existence of the federal government of the United States to a vote. So if you want to help out, a lot of people who embrace this worldview decide that voting is a total waste of time, and I would agree that 99% of the time it is. But you look at marijuana legalization in the United States, for example, if you guys notice, weed is so legal it's not even fun to smoke anymore. When you can actually come out and make a difference, it really is worth coming out and engaging the system and developing a consensus. And I think this is one of those amazing historical opportunities where we can do this. So I've been sharing a lot of memes. Growing my hair out to uh, politician length. It's my favorite Abraham Lincoln quote. We should have limited government, like we should have limited cancer. So, one of the lessons I learned from, uh, from my activism and, and my time in the military is that yes, if the troops defended freedom, they'd attack the government. 
And I'm going to end this tonight. I hope, I hope you've all have had fun with my philosophical musings and my advice to activists and sharing a little bit of my motivation. But, you know, right now we do have something immediately in front of us that provides uh, a great opportunity to advance humanity and, and build a, a more peaceful world. And that is the unfortunate intervention by Donald Trump in Syria. I'm sure you're all familiar now. We've seen the strikes that were ordered, $100 million worth of military hardware that, you know, I don't know, could have been used to make America great here or some other way. But that's none of my business. Oh, wait, it is. Sorry. This is a... Uh, you know, one of those times where I hate to say I told you so to all the Trump supporters, but no, I don't hate to say I told you so. I love it. This is like one of those. <laughs> I told you so. If you don't have, if you don't have a fundamental paradigm shift behind an election, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, right? And I do like to see, and I'm, I'm very much an optimist. Obviously, I like to think of myself as a rational optimist because I take the long view of human history, and when you do that, it's impossible to deny what a beautiful story this has been, how far we've come, what an amazing experience the, the human journey has been so far. And I look at the election of Donald Trump, and I go, wow, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a really good sign. Not because Donald Trump's going to be president. I don't trust him. I don't believe anything he says. But what does it take to pander to the American people now to get elected? As a conservative or as a Republican, I guess not really conservative, but as a Republican, you're going to call for a new investigation of 9-11? You're going to declare a really strong anti-interventionist foreign policy? You're going to call out Obama on his interventionism? Really? Like, that's... that's uh, the, the Republican Party base is so desperate that they're willing to nominate Donald Trump? Holy crap! We can, we can look at the bright side of this, right? But hey, I told you so. Yeah. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't going to live up to the expectations that we had. So I'm doing an action tomorrow at the White House at noon. And if it's just me with a soapbox and a bullhorn, so be it. But I made a couple videos. I put up a Facebook event page. And I would be honored for all of you to join me tomorrow. And even if you can't be in D.C. at noon, this is something that I'm calling for. As an, I'm, 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 in, I'm extending as an invitation for everyone globally to participate in. And it's not just to say that you disagree with Trump, that you no longer support him if you did, that you won't stand for this betrayal, because that's, you know, that's an important part of it, too. And if you can just say, hey, tomorrow I'm going to take I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to get out and I'm going to say something. I'm going to tell my coworkers. I'm going to tell my family. I'm going to, because this is important. It's, 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 this is the, you know, the most violent part of government right now that we can, that we can actually step up and do something about. I, I have a message for Donald Trump. War is for losers. You're going to lose. You're going to lose so much you're going to be sick of losing. You're going to lose money, you're going to lose time, you're going to lose support. You're going to lose in 2020. Because in war, the only people who win are the profiteers. People are going to die. The American people are going to lose. The Syrian people are going to lose. Veterans are going to commit suicide. War is for losers. But what we have an opportunity to do here is not just protest. But what I really want to invite you to do, if you can join me, great. If you can help me out. We need some logistical support if anybody wants to, to drive us down to D.C. tomorrow morning. It would be awesome. Or tonight, anybody going back to D.C., meet me outside. i got a few copies of my book out there. I'll you know, be giving them away for free. Like I said, this book is free in every digital format possible, including an audio book. Go to thefreedomline.com. You can find everything else. You can find all the other information about this. I'm talking fast because Bob's about to give me the hook. Um, <laughs> What I really want to do with this that is so much more important towards building is building a culture of integrity within the military, where the rubber meets the road, where people like Michael New, who refused to put on a blue UN helmet, 
can be hailed as a hero for disobeying. Where someone like Aaron Watata, who was the first officer to refuse deployment in the Iraq war on the grounds that the war was illegal, was hailed as a hero. So that people like Chelsea Manning know that despite whatever persecution they face from government, the people will love and support them. And you have the power to help do this. How many of you know somebody who's in the military? How many of you have talked to them and let them know what you really think about government? Yeah, not, okay. Oh, all right. Hey, okay. Decent number of hands there. Well, this is a chance where we have a specific thing that we can communicate to them to say, look, these are unlawful orders. This is a call to integrity. This is a call to the law of the Constitution. If the president creates an act of war without a declaration of war from Congress, it is illegal. Simple as that. If you are in the United States military, you have not just a moral, but now a legal obligation to disobey illegal orders. And that's really the message of this protest. So thank you. Well, geez, now I really need to get off the stage. Huh? It's not going to get any better than this. Thank you very much. Peace, love, anarchy, freedom. Mwah. I'll see you on the internet. I'll see you right outside. I hope to see you in D.C. tomorrow. Thefreedomline.com. Thank you so much, Bob.